Our New Testament lesson for today comes from John 13, 31 through 35. Let us listen to, for the word of the Lord. When Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as you have loved this, as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a documentary that's uh, been on public uh, television lately, uh, uh, Jackie Robinson. How many of you have seen that, by the way? Okay, uh, well, a couple of mo years ago, there was a movie out called 42 about Jackie Robinson. Hey, who saw that one? Yes. We love movies and uh, documentaries is okay. But in both of the movie and the documentary, there's an individual named Branch Rickey. And Branch Rickey... Uh, was instrumental in making a major change in baseball, actually in culture at large. Because up until then, this we're talking about the way back 1940s or sometime, baseball was divided, black and white. You had Major League Baseball, all white, and then you had the Negro League, which was all African American, and people didn't go to each other's games. There was a great divide not just in baseball, but the whole country. Branch Rickey was determined to break the color lines in society, and he could do this in baseball. And one of the uh, things that was asked of him quite often was why it was so important to him. And his answers changed, depending on who was asking the question. And sometimes he would say, well... We'll make more money if we get more people to the stadiums, and we'll get more talent on the field if we can go to everyone. But one of the answers he gave most frequently, and very often to um, complement the other answers he was sometimes giving, was because since he was a young boy in uh, church, he was taught that the Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself. And he took that to heart. Love. Way back in the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, we are told, love your neighbor as yourself. And we hear Jesus saying those same words in the New Testament. Time and time and time again, we are told, love your neighbor as yourself. Love is a key component in the Christian faith. Now, there's a tradition in the history of the church that the Apostle John, when he was an old man living in Ephesus, he would go to church all the time, and he always had to be carried by some of the younger uh, Christians in the church. <clears throat> and once at the, the church worship service, John would often be asked to preach. I mean, let's think about this. Here is John, the last living apostle. Here's a man who walked with Jesus, not spiritually, but physically walked with Jesus. He was there to see the crucifixion. He was there at the resurrection. And of course, of course, people wanted him to preach. And John could have said something like, well, you know, I, was, uh, I remember one day Jesus and I, we were walking along the beach. And he told me this parable, and I don't think we wrote that in the gospel, so I'm going to tell it to you now. How great that would be. Or John could have said something like, you know, there are lots of other prayers that Jesus taught us to pray besides the Lord's Prayer. Let me teach this one to you. Or John might have said, Rabbi Jesus, preacher Peter, and I walked into a tavern one day, and Jesus turned to us and said, you know, this reminds me of a joke. <laughs> How cool that would have been. But John never did that, according to this tradition. Whenever he was asked to preach, he would use the same sermon <laughs> every single time. It was a short sermon. Little children, love one another, 
The end. Sit down. That's it. As tradition goes, time after time, the younger Christians became tired of this. They, they wanted to hear something new and different. They asked, Master, why do you always preach the same sermon? It's so short. And uh, John would say, it's the Lord's command. And if you learn how to do this, it's enough. Now, this story, it is an old tradition. It comes from St. Jerome. He was one of the early church fathers. And whether it's true or not, it is a clear example of how central the command to love is to the Christian faith. Why do we love others? Well, first of all, Christ commanded us to do that, so we tend to take that seriously, anything Jesus commands. And here in the New Testament lesson for this morning, in what amounts to a farewell address, Jesus is telling his disciples that they must learn to obey a new commandment, love one another. Love is active, it's real, it's difficult. Douglas John Hall of Canada's McGill University uh, gave a speech one time, and he said that Christ's law makes tolerance insufficient. He said it may be good enough for the law, and it may be good enough for politics, but it's never enough for us to go out and live our lives in terms of tolerate your neighbor. As Christians, we must learn to love our neighbor. Why do we love? Not just because Christ commanded it, but because we are loved by God, even though we don't deserve it. John wrote in his first letter, 1 John chapter 4, we love because God first loved us. Why do we love? Because it's a way of life that while it is difficult, it, it works. James Cagle writes about a, a young woman named Sarah, and Sarah came from a family where there was very little love, cri criticism, fighting, ridicule, violence. That was all the norm in the family. Never were words spoken like, I love you, or I'm sorry, I apologize, forgive me. And then Sarah found Christ in her life, and she put this newfound faith of hers at work. And um, she began to act differently at home, and uh, she would find herself in the middle of a fight, a fight that she probably started most of the time, and then interrupt the fight by saying, I'm sorry. And then she would look at her mom and her dad and say, I love you, mom. I love you, dad. Uh, she would accept other people's forgiveness. She began to return blessings for curses, compliments for ridicules, forgiveness when wronged, and over a period of two years, this began to have an effect on the rest of the family, and the rest of the family found Christ as well, and they began to love one another. It changed everything in the dynamic of that home. Jesus commands us to love because it will change our lives and change the lives of other people, and it works. Okay, we get that love is commanded by Christ, practiced by God. It works in our lives if we do it. But this command to love is old news. Jesus in the New Testament says it's a new commandment. But, it, you know, it kind of feels familiar. It feels old. Love, 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 love. You know, heard that in sermons so many times. It's old stuff. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. He said it many times. And and here he says, this is a new commandment. Have you ever gone into the store to buy your favorite shampoo, and it says new and improved, and you get home, and it's the same old stuff? I'm always being enticed to go uh, eat the new and improved meal at one of my favorite restaurants. And I tell you, it just tasted exactly the same as it did a month ago. New and improved? I don't know what that's about. It's marketing. Is that what Jesus is trying to do here? No. No, there is something new here. <clears throat> Everywhere else we're told to love our neighbor as ourselves. 
Love our neighbor as ourselves. And now Jesus is saying something a little different, a lot different. Love as I have loved you. And remember, this is what amounts to his farewell address. He's getting his disciples ready for his death, his crucifixion, and the resurrection, but he's trying to get them to understand he's about to die. And he's doing that out of love. And at this moment, he's saying, I want you to love as I am loving you. The bar is being raised here. It's not that we are just to love others as we love ourselves. We are now told to love others the way Christ loves us. That's a big deal. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is approached by a teacher of the law, and he says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what's written in the law, Jesus asks. Um, how do you read it? Uh, I love the way Jesus is exactly like every professor I had in college. Ask a question, you get a question back. He's going to draw the answer out of you. And he said, the teacher of the law said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus said. Do this and you will live. But this teacher of the law wanted to justify himself and say, but who is my neighbor? And that's what we want to know. We are perfectly willing to love others as long as they deserve our love. We love good people. We might even love evil people as long as they are safely behind bars. To love people who are in our neighborhoods that we're afraid of. To love people who are different from us. To love people who are violent. And yet that's the way Jesus loved. He didn't qualify how we are to love our neighbor as ourself. He didn't say which neighbor we were supposed to love. We were supposed to love them all. And he raises the bar here and he says, I want you to love as I have loved you. Freely abundantly, without reservation, without any qualification. And that's tough. Because we live in an age where we've never lived through anything like this before. You know, what did Jesus know about ISIS? What did a previous generation know about evil? It's never been a time like this. Well, maybe there have been a couple of times. Well, maybe it's always been this way. World War II, goodness, that was 60, 70 years ago. And yet, the stories that were told in that conflict, that war, still inspire us and motivate us today. Ernest Gordon was a Presbyterian minister. He died just a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And before becoming a minister, he was an atheist, and he was a veteran of World War II. And he served as an officer in the Pacific Theater. He was captured and held prisoner by the Japanese Army. And during the Second World War, history shows that uh, Japan treated their prisoners of war with extreme cruelty. The death rate was quite high. At one point, uh, Gordon was placed in the death ward, where fellow prisoners took care of other prisoners who were expected to die. And while in the death ward, Gordon was treated by two fellow allied soldiers, both of whom were Christians. And one of them, Dusty Miller, never met cruelty of the enemy with anger or discouragement. Two years before the end of the war, or I'm sorry, two weeks before the end of the war, a Japanese guard who had had it with Dusty and his uh, frustrating ability to respond to cruelty with respect or with submission or obedience, but never with anger or violence. This Japanese guard took Dusty and made a homemade cross and crucified him, nailing him 
to this cross and waiting for him to slowly die. Yeah, we can't make excuses that we've never lived in a world with such evil as we live today. It's, it's always been here. In his book, Miracle on the River Kwai, Ernest Gordon described how the Allied soldiers not only cared for their own, but even for the guards who were so vicious to them. <coughs> Gordon's book tells of a very moving incident in which the British soldiers or prisoners of war tend to the uh, wounds of the injured uh, Japanese soldiers and fed them. The Japanese would be encrusted with mud and blood and excrement. Their wounds were badly inflamed and infected. Their own army had left them behind uncared for because their army did not have enough resources or food for themselves. And when the pris British prisoners saw them, they took pity on them, bathed their wounds and shared with them a little of the food that was too little for themselves even. Now think of that. These soldiers were caring for their enemies who had starved them, beaten them, killed their comrades. And yet God gave those Christians among those prisoners the strength to respond with hate, with love. Now the natural thing would have been for these POWs to have, well, their soldiers left and we're going to leave them too. We don't have enough food for ourselves. That would have been natural. We would have understood that. But these prisoners found the courage not only to love their neighbor as themselves, but to love as Christ loved. Because Christ had loved these people enough so that whether they responded to it or not, Christ died for them as well as for us. The ability of those British POWs to love their enemy guards, that's what made them different. And I guarantee you, it was not easy. It was hard. Christ's command, not suggestion, love one another as I have loved you. And now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be ascribed all might, power, dominion, and glory, today and forever. Amen.